Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon and welcome to the post 31, Storying. After our last series, the pernicious PhD supervisor series, it is time for our Return of the Jedi moment. In the next few vlogs, we're going to explore the inspiring, the imaginative, the extraordinary. What I want to do is for all of us to share the passionate and engaging ideas in our present so that we can construct a better future. And this week is an incredibly powerful and amazing area, inspired from a suggestion by Queen Kath. Hello, the wonderful Queen Kath. And I've been looking at storying and storytelling as a literature, as a research area for about the last 30 years. So it's a remarkable area. And can I say with incredible pleasure, this incredible area with a great legacy and heritage has had all these new shoots in the last five years. So let's explore storying and its relationship with storytelling and its relationship with narrative. And what I want to do is explore the relationship between storying and you. You as a human, you as a reader, you as a writer, you as a thinker. And I'd like to dedicate the post this week to Jess. You've got this, Jess. So let's start with some nuggety questions, shall we? Three questions for you. First question. What are the stories that you tell yourself about yourself? Second question, what are the stories that you tell about yourself to others? And the third question is, <laughs> what are the differences between those stories? You see, stories are important because they inform us, they challenge us, they socialize us, they guide us, and yes, they can transform us. When we share stories, we don't only share meanings, but we provide a door, a gateway into a context of another human being. We really understand the stories of others in the way that they intended them to be understood because we can share the story and the language, but we can never share and understand the context from which that story emerged. So something always changes as we move a story from one environment or context to another. And these contexts often negotiate colonialism and a post-colonial environment, race and racism, age and ageism, nationalism and xenophobia, class and inequality, just to name a few. And these are the structural barriers that block us truly understanding the stories of others in the way that those stories were originally intended. So stories are troubling, and that's great because stories challenge our secure sense of self. Because when we listen to the stories of others, we see the institutions, the truths, the histories, the organisations that we've sort of taken for granted all our lives. When we listen to the stories of others, we see those institutions and people and ideas in a completely different way. Stories are a door. And when we listen to them, we understand them, we reflect on them, we walk through that door into the context of other people. So as you can see, storying is transformative. So let's now right at the start, we've already thrown a few words about, let's try and understand the key terms and vocabulary in this paradigm or field. So stories, pretty straightforward, a mode of communication and stories emerge from a place and they create and build relationships. Stories can be spoken, stories can be written, they can be danced, they can be sung, they can be sculpted, they can be painted, just to name a few platforms. Stories are different from 
narrative. Yes, we're going there. Now, as a lot of you know, I did a lot of work on narrative through a lot of my degrees. I did a lot of work on continental literature and continental philosophy. And so I did a lot of work on narrative. And I read Todorov and I read Pop. And you can see right to even the research I've done this year and published this year, you still see references to Todorov and Pop. And I continue to use them. Great scholars. But stories are not narratives. Narrative is a word, but it's also a trope that carries credibility with it. And the word narrative has credibility in disciplines like history, English literature, business, health, and education. So a narrative has credibility and it carries power with it. So think about all the chronological narratives you were taught at school. Too often those chronological narratives were termed history, often with a capital H. So what was this? Well, this was fact upon fact upon fact upon fact. And these facts were organized by time into a chronological narrative. And what happens when you do this is a chronological narrative has propulsion. It has a power through its relentlessness. This happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. And you sort of follow what happened. But the actual point of a narrative is to stop critical thought. To stop thinking, to stop the very realisation that there are alternative truths, alternative facts that for some reason are cut away or blocked out of this momentum and propulsion for one fact after another. So why are these facts excluded? Why are they not seen to be valuable or important when we're being taught chronology and narrative? And there are many answers to that question. One is that these facts that are magically left out of the narrative destroy or crush or indeed critique the credibility that all these organisations have invested in a chronological narrative. Now, as a lot of you know, my first two degrees were in history and I took those history degrees from quite a, a posh, quite a posh university, very elite and also very traditional. And, you know, I got to that university and I'll be really honest with you all, it, I felt, you know, that duck out of water, I just felt like I didn't belong. I was sort of this working class girl in this posh degree, in this posh university, and I had the wrong accent, I still do. Uh, I didn't dress appropriately, I still don't. And of course I didn't go to the right school, and of course I still didn't. And I was being taught these chronological narratives. And I realised these chronological narratives left out most of the population of the entire world. Because social history and oral history and women's history and so forth were just starting to appear in the undergraduate programs and courses in which I enrolled. And for example, post-structuralism as a theory was only introduced in one seminar in my honours year. So I realised very quickly in these degrees in history that there was no one like me in history. There was no one like my family being talked about in history. And in fact, there was no one like the weird and wonderful community I was living in at the time, a wonderful suburb, although not really called Birds Beach in Western Australia. These sort of communities were never even really talked about. It wasn't really a working class community because none of us were really in work. So in these histories, where were the unemployed? Where were the underemployed? Where were the sick? Where were the crew with impairments or disabilities? Where were migrants? Where were the loners? Where were the lonely? So outside of my coursework for these posh degrees, I started to read wildly <laughs> different reading from cultural studies and particularly 
popular cultural studies and particularly a, a rather radical academic who I discovered who was living and working in Manchester, one Professor Steve Redhead. So I read everything that he had ever written and then probably the best decision I ever made. I then went through and I started to read everything that Steve ever referenced in his bibliographies. That became my new reading list. And when I enrolled in the third year of my history degree, I was sitting in the library coffee shop with a precious, precious book that I bought with money that I didn't have. <laughs> And this book was so incredibly important to me. I was sitting in the coffee shop, obviously because I bought the book, I couldn't afford a coffee in the coffee shop, but I was sitting there and this book wasn't on any reading list one could ever imagine, but it was had been reviewed by Steve Redhead as a book review and I loved the title and I loved the cover. And this book was Greel Marcus's Lipstick Traces. A Secret History of the 20th Century. And I remember reading the first paragraph on page six. I remember where I was when I read that paragraph. I remember the table I was sitting at. I remember the windows. I remember the light coming in at a particular angle when I read this paragraph. I was hyper sensate. So what was this paragraph? Well, Grill Marcus wrote, quote, What is history anyway? Is history simply a matter of those moments that leave behind those things that can be weighed and measured, new institutions, new winners, new losers? Or is history also a result of those moments that seem to leave nothing behind? Nothing but the mystery of spectral connections between people long separated by place and time. If the language they are speaking, the impulse they are voicing, has its own history, might it not tell a very different story from the one we've been hearing all our lives? End of quote. My life, my entire professional, intellectual life, has been constructed in response to that paragraph on page six. To listen for that different language and to attempt to understand the spectral connections between people long separated by place and time. And to start writing those different stories from the ones we've been hearing all our lives. And of course, that is the gift of storytelling pedagogy and andragogy. It challenges radically the disciplinary boundaries of history. It questions master narratives and activates very different research methodologies and writing strategies. So what does it mean to live and work and sweat and cry and be frightened and be lonely. Where are those stories? So as you can see, story is not narrative. Narrative is a word of credibility, power, prestige. Storytelling is about voices being heard, understood, recognised, so that those voices can enlarge our very way of knowing. Now, there has been through my life some pretty arbitrary, binarised separations between everyday life and storytelling and academic life and narratives. Really, really unproduct unproductive binary opposition, can I say. And Davies and Gannon described this separation as being between the, quote, totalising truths of academic life and local situated truths of storytelling in our daily life. Wow. So Louise Gwyneth Phillips and Tracy Bunder, wow, in their remarkable 2018 book, Research Through, With and As Storying, will change your life. 
incredible book, one of the books of the 21st century as far as I'm concerned. And they des described and defined storying as, quote, the act of making and remaking meaning through stories, end of quote. This is magnificent. Meaning is made and remade. It is not inherited. It is made and remade, and therefore it's constantly in flux. So what are stories? Well, stories are data sets. Stories are theories. They're methodologies, and they transform our very ontology. Stories also, importantly, I think, activate the ethical responsibilities of research and scholarship, that we are actively accountable when we select one data set over another and we explain how and why we've made those decisions because we must not simply select a data set because it's more convenient, it's easier to understand, it's easier to access. But we have to explain our data sets and when we do that we activate our accountability in the selection of research questions, the configuration of research literature, and also our methodologies. And it forces us to explain to diverse audiences why our research matters. Therefore, whether we're talking about experimental physics and engineering, through a theology or art and design, storytelling is crucial to our research projects. It's, I would argue, crucial to the very nature of being an intellectual. Daniel Kahneman stated that, quote, and I love this, quote, no one ever makes a decision because of a number. They need a story, end of quote. So whenever anyone from the empirical sciences or empirical social sciences use statements like, and we hear it a lot, just give me the data. Let the data tell the story. I sort of laugh, and you can see the foolishness of such phrases, because how do we approach that data set? What's the story going in to the data set? What's the story going out of the data set? Now, Mark Carpenter and Daryl Harmon offered, I think, the best justification to scientists, begging scientists, to become the master storytellers that we need you to be. They stated that, quote, storytelling is sense making, end of quote. So these stories demonstrate the importance of the data set and also the impact of that data set as it moves through the world. Put another way, if I haven't convinced you yet of the value of stories, storytelling and storying, no matter what your discipline. The legendary Harrelson Monarth stated that, quote, data can persuade people, but it doesn't inspire them to act. Well, you can persuade people, but does it inspire them to do something? That's what stories do. Because storytelling answers the crucial question in our lives. And that crucial question is, why? Why? Stories, like research itself, they're fluid, they're agile, they're dynamic, they're delicate. They're also profound and profoundly important for Indigenous scholars who are deploying a remarkable array of methodologies at the moment. I've been watching yarning as an, a methodology in many Indigenous nations in Australia powerful methodological interventions through yarning. Uh, I advise you, please engage in some of those dialogues. We're all learning a lot there. And of course, in terms of whakapapa, the sharing of whakapapa from Māori, powerful, transformative stories for Aotearoa New Zealand from the past to the present to the future. The epistemological value of storying and storytelling for Indigenous scholars, Indigenous citizens, transforms our very conventions for research. 
and demands that all of us, again, do harder work, think more deeply about methodology and epistemology and ontology. Particularly, and this is what is what of specific interest to me, can I say, is storing offers us a very different way of thinking about what is worthy and what is important research and also what is measurable and what is accountable in research. These are big questions. These are big questions of our time. Stories are important and there's no guarantee ever that that story is going to be heard or listened to or understood. Now, when these stories are heard and listened to and understood, as for Indigenous Australians, they are the strategy to sustain the longest living culture in the world. And that's power. I wanted to particularly log a definitional distinction between storytelling and storying. This is new and this is important. And I've been strongly convinced and influenced by Phillips and Bunda and that great book I talked about. Because storytelling absolutely enables connections because stories contain and sustain language and culture. But storying is research. So what storying is, is it conveys the research in storytelling. So if you will, storying is meta of storytelling. And so what it does is storying theorizes the research within the stories. Wow. So if you will, storytelling is a methodology but storying is the epistemological arc here. And together, whenever methodology or epistemology are dancing in a new way, ontologies must transform. And that's why storying is so important to Indigenous researchers, because we're locating the shapes and the textures and the structures for knowledge outside of colonial frameworks. And that's probably the most important decisions we'll ever make. Storying is a way to translate knowledge between different communities with particular attention to the knowledges and the voices of those who are silenced, of those who are marginalised. And if you think about it, so much of our academic lives <laughs> are about individual success. An individual achievement. Look at me, look at me, I'm terribly important, me, 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 me. And we're using all these really inelegant proxies for supposedly objective values of research. And so often we're emphasising the intellect, the mind, and we're cutting away corporeality. We're cutting away the body and all the sensory information that comes to our body through our senses. So as you can see, storying and storytelling activate communities, connections, and corporeal knowledges for all of us, whether we're scholars, whether we're citizens, storying demands that we work harder. We work a lot harder to communicate, to connect, and we work a lot harder to ask and answer why. Why? These strategies are important for all disciplines, all academic fields. They're actually important for research. But I did want to sort of finish off as we're moving towards the end of the post this week to think about the importance of storying for researchers. Now, we've just finished our pernicious PhD supervisor session and we've shared a lot together. We've seen the consequences of particular people taking an easy option, socially or sexually or intellectually, harming other humans so that they can succeed. But storying has an honesty about it because it demands that we are vulnerable. Indeed, vulnerability must be the very punctuation of storying and storytelling. It is empowering for the self 
to talk about the mistakes that we have made and the dreams that we've not accomplished. We learn to talk about pain. We learn to talk about regret. And we empower others to talk about their pain, their regret, their mistakes. And when any of us talk about fear or longing or failure, then that ensures that the people around us know that they are not alone. Matthew Dix described this as, quote, living out loud, end of quote. And he developed a, a technique in his book that's actually changed my life, changed the way I approach my entire working day, to be frank. And look, there's a lot of talk in the literature about the importance of journaling, of course, and reflecting, and there's good literature on that, and there's no doubt that's very helpful for teachers, for researchers, for human beings. I'm not doubting that. But Dix has focused that project, and he asks that at the conclusion of every day, we ask and answer one question. And that one question is, quote, what is my story from today? What is my story from today? This is a powerful question. Yes, it makes sure that you reflect on the day, always strong, but it's asking you, you know what, make some meaning from this day and make sure that you realise when we put meaning in a day, that we don't lose that day. The day is not filled with regret. The day is filled with a story that has answered a why. Whenever in life we go through these challenges, I think it's helpful for us all to ask, what is my story from today? And when we answer this question meaningfully and consistently, then the what of my story becomes the why of my life. What is my life about? suddenly becomes why my life matters and why the life of people around me matters. That's a great technique while we're studying, while we're researching, while we're teaching. But to be frank, this is an amazing strategy in how to live. How to live a more peaceful life a more meaningful life. Folk tales and fairy tales and fables do not require vulnerability. Storytelling and storying requires intellectual, personal and professional vulnerability. We have to be honest, we have to be transparent and we live in a ruthless time of liars of fakes, of pretenders. But even more importantly, I think, for those of us who teach at any level of education, we have to ask ourselves, how do we become better teachers of storytelling? How do we become better teachers of storytelling? How do we enable the next generation to tell their most authentic difficult, accountable truth. So I've been thinking about this question a lot as I was doing the research and then writing and learning the vlog for you this week. And what I've realised is a story is not about events. <laughs> it's not about chronology. A story is about change. How we began as one version of ourselves and how we became somebody different. This is storying that has an agenda. It has values. It has meaning. And when we find our beginning, we also find our ending. And of course, these beginnings are rarely a start. For many of us, the beginning of our story is perhaps a, a five-second moment in our life 
where something happened, where we made a decision, where we had to pivot. And it's a great question for all of us to ask and answer, I think. Where does our story start? And I was recently asked, I was talking with a, a gentleman in Canada, and I was recently asked by this gentleman, oh, so where were you born? First question, where were you born? Odd, I answered him, but in, you know, sort of a noun describes a place, but that's not the beginning. A birth is never the beginning of our story. Our arrival as a fully fleshed, fully feeling human being. That's the beginning of our story. And that frequently comes <laughs> so much later. Stories have an arc. And the shape of that arc determines what's at stake. And that's why stories are so active. They're not the passive telling of facts. Kendall Haven in the great book Story Proof stated that, quote, the elements that define story structure create context and relevance. These elements then create motivation in the reader or the listener to pay attention, to process, to absorb and remember incoming information, end of quote. Now, Haven is brilliant here. And of course, that's why stories are used by great leaders. And that's why great followership emerges through the inspiration of great leaders. Because trust comes from vulnerability. Now, I know everything in our culture, our families, our workplaces, everything attempts to make us feel strong. I'm strong. I'm important, right? I'm tough. I'm unyielding. Toughen up, princess. I'm strong. I can do it. Come on. Unyielding. And look, you may get respect that way. You may get respect from strength. But you'll never gain trust. Storying and storytelling exist, particularly as a pair, to build trust because stories are inductive. They move from a premise or a maxim, provide examples, and then offer more generalizable truths. As Stephen Denning has stated, quote, storytelling is an amplifier, end of quote. So when we tell stories, we show people who we are. We build connections, we build collaborations, and when we share a story, we stop being a stranger. And I wanted to finish the post this week, as I always do, and I always look forward to hearing from you, your spectacular. The feedback from the last series of, of posts was unbelievable. So I love you, I appreciate you, I thank you for all that you are. But as I finish off the post this week, I wanted to present a statement from the great Alan Rickman that then provides the trigger to my final story. And the late Alan Rickman was for me in a very few of the best actors of all time. And his death from pancreatic cancer shook me because his illness was not public and his death and illness, his death was announced the day after he actually died by his wife and so his illness was suffered in secret and if you remember it was a hell of a week when Alan Rickman died because David Bowie died in the same week and he also kept his illness secret and it was announced uh, after his death by his wife so when my late husband the great popular cultural scholar that he was Steve Redhead gained and I'm sure you're already ahead of me when he got pancreatic cancer he remembered the example of Bowie and Rickman and he followed their life and their death course. And we'll return to that death in a moment. But the legendary Alan Rickman stated that, quote, it's a human need to be told stories. The more we're governed by idiots 
and have no control over our destinies, the more we need to tell stories to each other about who we are, why we are, where we've come from, and what might be possible. End of quote. So I'll share my story, my pincer of flesh and blood and bone and meaning in my 53 years. So before Steve was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and he went on to die on March 8, 2018, before Steve was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, I believed that life had a purpose. Life was a joy, life was exciting, everything was fabulous, every day was a delight. I believed that. And when Steve died, I no longer believed that. I knew that life was cruel, horrific, and filled with despair. That such a brilliant man who knew so much, who loved life so much, he was reading and writing up till three days before he died. The man whose ideas influenced and transformed the world. The idea that everything he was died and was cre cremated along with his body. That was the moment of change for me. We don't matter because everything we feel, everything we've loved, everything we've believed dies with us. And so between these two stories, one of great hope and one of great despair that spanned eight months of my life, I discovered a truth. And it is, to be frank, my only truth. Courage is getting up every day, helping somebody, working hard, while knowing that every single day is actually pointless. Every morning I wake up and my first thought, I wake up at 2am, every morning I wake up and my first thought is Steve is still dead. So my lens to life, my first lens to life every morning is death. But that gives us great courage knowing that death awaits us and every single morning making a decision to live. What this moment taught me is that these moments are all we have. The lens of death has shown me that all of us only have one superpower and that superpower is to be present in the present to sit in the terrifying confusing frightening present of another person and to show up for that person to take them by the hand to look them in the eye and walk with them through that fear and despair and horror to be present in the present so when we are present in the present of others we're loaning them our past so that they have a chance of a future life ends but to be present in the present of others ensures that they can survive we can loan them our courage for a little while until they don't need it anymore. May your stories loan courage to the people around you. I wish you love, light and peace. Tia.